tonight was going to be about uh recording is on this is the mini this is the mini we have a mini opening yeah oh yeah, we, okay that makes sense yeah so we have a mini uh about about <laughs> learning uh how why it's difficult to learn other programming languages and then we're going to be talking about peer-to-peer -peer information systems okay. so uh without further ado uh krishna take it away cool uh yeah so i'm uh krishna i work at amazon in seattle um i uh sorry whatever i had said yeah i didn't uh, have too much time to prepare for this talk so i'm just going to walk you through my notes for the most part um versus actually having a presentation or anything fancy that way uh let me try to figure out how to share my screen um yeah okay i think this should work can you guys see my screen looks good yep awesome so i'll be talking about this paper i found it was quite interesting uh none of uh, i shall preface this with say none of it was like particularly revolutionary but seeing it all codified in the same paper was uh, a really interesting read and sort of helped me um join things together so without further ado i shall talk about what this paper is trying to do um so the first, so the 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 preface of the paper, which is mainly about Peter Novak's Python for Lisp, program, Lisp programmers, um, he mentions that most of the research is on beginners learning languages, and for experts, it's quite different. Um, and which is actually true because as a beginner, um, you sort of like understand a lot of things. You probably pick one language up and you start from first principles, but. Um, I've often found that like, like even though I know a lot of language pretty well, uh, even like if I pick the next one up, it becomes harder. It's still a bit hard. Um, and so it's like, uh, so that's kind of the question is that is, do people uh, have difficulty, do experts still experience difficulty learning programming languages? Um, and, the, uh, and then they sort of go to a couple of anecdotes which I found, uh, which this this one really applies to me, the first one, because I did try it. Um, if you think you can learn Kotlin quickly because you know Java, you are wrong. Um, and that is definitely true. Um, they have things called extension functions and uh, other things, which is, which is cool in principle, but I have no idea when would you actually use it? And how do you actually use it? Things like that. Um, similar thing for CoffeeScript with JavaScript. Um, and then uh, they, they give like two information from psychology to sort of start thinking about the pieces. Um, one of them is knowledge interference. Um, and they talk about how your previous knowledge interferes with your new knowledge. Uh, so if you're trying to learn something, anything that you know previously may interfere. So that's one option or it can be facilitated. So uh, they give a grocery store example where you can walk through the bread aisle and uh, and and if they move the bread aisle to some other place, which Costco does a lot, uh, you get, it's harder to find something. So you have to keep walking to the through this one. And I do this a lot in Costco. Uh, but the other thing is that if if the frozen food is in a certain area and you you hear of a new frozen food, you can go to the frozen aisle and find it. And so that's uh, an example of facilitation. And so the question is, uh, do uh, does a knowledge of a previous programming language facilitate or interfere with new language? Uh, I shall pause there for a second because just to hear if anyone had anything to say. If not, uh, we can move to the next part. So the way they did this was uh, uh, was with they they tried to answer three questions uh, with various uh, uh, techniques. Um, the first one is. Does cross language interference occur? Um, which is which, and and for this they actually uh, examine Stack Overflow to figure out whether there's interference between languages. Um, the second one is uh, do experience, how do experienced programming language uh, how do experienced programmers learn new language? Uh, and for and, and the third one uh, the second third were both uh, via interviews. Uh, the third one is what do experienced programmers find confusing in a new language? So these three, using these three, they try to figure out what could be like, how do experts learn and not learn languages? Um, yeah, 
I've noted down the stuff of the how they did the data collection, but I'll probably skip it and I'll just, just talk about what they did for Stack Overflow. Um, so the so effectively they they use uh, BigQuery with to to query a, um, a data set, uh, and the, and the way they decided whether a query query was applicable was whether the question was applicable is if it was text if it was tagged in both languages, or it was uh, it it was tagged in this in a in in like say in a source language but can contain the text of the target language in the body or the title. So for example, it was tagged as Ruby, but they uh, said, hey, can you help me learn Java, for example? Um, so that's the kind of uh, it, it, uh, the, the, the technique they used to get the, get the Stack Overflow posts. Uh, and then they had like a labeling criteria, which, uh, which, which, which effectively is to figure out whether people could, um, whether the authors could uh, point to correctly, whether the question is, whether the author could label the paper correctly or not and what did they label the questions so they labeled it in two fashions one is correct assumptions and incorrect assumptions so the post makes the connection to a previous language with the correct assumption regarding the target language uh, and the other ones the exact inverse uh, and what does this mean so this is kind of like if you are talking about say java and kotlin and java is your source language which you know familiarly you'll be like hey is this like I have a problem in Kotlin? I'm not able to do something. And did you make the assumption already that the classes are going to be final, or did you, um, you know, did you did you is that a miss? And did you have just a wrong assumption regarding it? Um, and so that was the first uh, technique, uh, and which they used. The second one was uh, study with interview for interviews with professional programmers. They say they use something called purposive sampling to recruit 16 programmers. Um, I looked it up and I couldn't exactly understand what purposive sampling is. So I don't know if anyone over here knows what purposive sampling is. Um, um, I, I, I've never heard that before, yeah. It's yeah, I, I couldn't really understand, but it's kind of like instead of using a random sample, you actually specifically target people. That's the general gist of it. Uh, so I, th that's the only difference that I could figure out is that it's different from a random sample where you just pick pick six random people for a, from who fit a certain criteria. They targeted this one. So the participants were early in their learning process. They had like five to 31 years of programming experience. So that was the uh, this one. And there's 14 unique language transitions. So and they, they listed down over here, which, you know, C to C++, C, C sharp to Visual Basic, et cetera. Um, and then uh, they uh, they they considered uh, they constructed semi-structured interviews, and they have they tried to figure out the two questions that they had based on the interviews. So now for the results. Um, so I'll, I'll I'll do the results in two phases. One is the uh, Stack Overflow one, and then they have this amazing table which I'll just go through. Um, so the results effectively. Um, so the results is what you, what I would at least expect is that cross language interference does occur. Um, so one of the things with, they they sort of looked at R to Python, and uh, I have not done R, but uh, one of this one that they they couldn't do R to Python, and and in my head those two feel very similar because R is a statistical modeling language, and Python does have a lot of scikit and scipy tools. Uh, but one of the things they say is that uh, like simple things like uh, what uh, like R, Python prevents assignments of copies to data frames, and this is specifically to pandas. Um, whereas it does not work exactly like how R would work. Uh, the next one is PHP to JavaScript. Um, this one is more about how uh, PHP stores like server side session variables with dollar session, and uh, that that causes. Uh, 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 the, like that causes programmers to assume that that uh, dollar that that the session state is just automatically stored in a global variable. Um, so that is uh, an interesting thing that I've never thought about, um, but I could see that happening. Um, and then the third one is Java to Kotlin, and this is one which I've experienced myself. Um, and 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 I think like the one thing about Kotlin is that you, the, the more verbose your code is, you figure out it's wrong. And so this is one of the examples of where facilitation happens. Where uh, I've seen some things where like Kotlin, like I've written code and then I've asked my teammate, hey, could you 
could you look at this code? And then there's a, I just know that there's a simpler way to do things because Kotlin has native collections and a lot of different things. And I've used Java type constructs to do a lot of um, assignments and uh, building like data classes is one of those things. I wrote the getters and setters myself. Uh, I was trying to find Lombok in, in this one and I knew those were like wrong so automatically. Um, so, cro so cross language this one, the data is uh, from, they analyzed 450 posts and out of that 61% contained incorrect assumptions. Um, yeah, uh, I'll pause over here to see if anyone had anything, any stories about cross language interference for themselves. I, I, I mean, I, so I, I went from, uh, I, this was a long time ago. I, I was going from Ruby to Java and I just, I just remember how infuriated I was. Uh, like, and this was back in uh, uh, Java six days, so that dates me. But like, I, I was just frustrated that I can't have functions as first class citizens. I was like, why, why can't I do this? It's, it's so like, because my brain was thinking in in one way, like how how I thought about programming had you know. The, some of these like functional ideas that just at the time at least weren't in Java and it was just infuriating that I had to learn a totally different way of doing it when I'm like I could do this more succinctly if I was using this other language but you know <laughs> of course the switch yeah uh, yep. when I uh, when I uh, I do work with uh, like Python a lot and people who come to Python from like OO languages write very OO. Python, which I don't think is very good Python. Yep. So. Yeah. I yeah, started I've learning Erlang recently, and I was familiar with like Ruby that has symbols as distinct from variables. Uh, Erlang uses the capitalization of the first letter, and I was staring at code where I had used a lowercase variable name and couldn't assign to it because it was just a symbol. And it took me like hour to figure out that my problem was I needed to capitalize a letter. Like, but it's not a class instance. <laughs> cool. Yep, it's always interesting to hear the different stories like, and uh, cool. So then I shall go to the next part, which is the, how do experienced programmers learn new languages and uh, uh, I forgot the third question, even though I remember the general gist of it. Um, it's uh, what they experience, what what they find confusing in new languages. Um, so I think like uh, yeah, this table is pretty succinct. So I can just walk through this table and I can do one. So the first one is how do they learn new languages? Uh, most programmers learn new languages on their own. Um, it's basically you figure out from some people a, a new language to do. And you 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 generally uh, you don't get formal training in it. Um, this is mostly true in in the settings that I work in for sure. Um, just in time learning, uh, this uh, you only learn features as you need it, and you don't actually um, you don't actually learn all of the language. So you, you sort of go step by step. Um, one of the things that I do often is I try to um, and, and it's kind of sort of ties to the th third one, which is relating a new language to the previous languages. And it's like, you try to map features of the new language to previous language. Uh, one of the things I do when I try to learn a new language is um, try to find code snippets of things that I already know. Like, so you just search for it and like, you know, like how do you do bubble sort or something as trivial as that to see what is the differences? Do they do loops differently? Uh, sometimes even some things like that uh, throw me off. Like, would I de do I need to do for i is equal to zero to i is equal to ten? I less than uh, length of the array, um, or like, is there um, is there a better way to do looping? Um, yeah, uh, I can pause over here too for the learning strategies. If anyone has any interesting learning strategies of their own that they do something differently. I tend to pick a trivial program to write, like. A uh, hangman game or something like that, and then just write that in the new programming language. Something that's complicated enough to require, like, to have loops and a very various other constructs, but not so complicated that 
you know, it would take a long time to write. I really like the Euler problems um, uh, and and writing them in different languages. I think that's that can be pretty fun, or at least the earlier ones that, that I actually know how to do, not the ones in the seven hundreds that are really hard. Yeah. Nice. I usually do hello world and then the eight queens problem. <laughs> That's pretty amazing. I only heard of like, I, I mean, I've thought of the thought of doing like, I do like a trivia game sometimes, like just because it's, it's an interactive session. So it helps me figure out CLIs if I need to do. Uh, and, and based on what I'm trying to do, I try to do it. But these are all really interesting. Cool. So then I should go. It to... is amazing how many people have the like go to program they've written in eight different languages for trying out a new one. <laughs> cool. So then uh, next one is about language interference is like, what do they find harder? Um, the first one is pretty obvious old habits die hard. Um, and this is pretty, uh, it's very hard to do things. Uh, in the correct way of the language, you do it in what you used to. Um, one of the interesting things over here was one of my teammates shared this article where um, some languages just make it easier to do things in a certain way. So you end up doing almost everything in that way, um, where you know it's just easier to do streams and uh, collections in like Java. And so a lot of things you end up using streams. Um, and so I find myself trying to like, do those things and then someone tells me a simpler way and then I keep overusing that hammer quite a bit. Um, the next one which they have is mind shift and switching paradigms. So um, this is like obvious if you go from functional to functional to imperative or any of those two, but even like between two imperative languages, even between two O languages, it's sometimes not exactly the same thing. Like I find even though Ruby is technically O. Um, I, I actually don't know how to do O in Ruby anymore because when I try to do O in Ruby, it just feels different than doing O in Java. Um, and uh, I think like Java, everything has to be a class, like there's no non-class constructs at all. Um, and that throws me off a lot when I go to Kotlin or Ruby or things like that. I shall pause here too for a second, if anyone has anything to do. Uh, yeah, uh, I think, I think definitely going from interpretive to compile to like, you know, or like something like rust, you know, throws people off pretty hard. Right. Cool. Then, uh, I shall, yes. Then, uh, basically if there's little to no mapping between previous languages, it's really hard, uh, which is, uh, like, you know, if you go to, especially if you go from, uh, from uh, programming on server side to a browser, like you've never worked with the DOM before, or uh, so HTML just throws you off. Uh, searching for terms and documentations is hard. One of the things like promises are not called promises in Java, they're called futures, things like that. Uh, they're not exactly the same thing. Uh, they are more or less the same thing. Yeah. Um, and then retooling is a challenge first, challenging first step. So basically that is the, the like you, you find it really hard to um, you're used to using a certain tool like IntelliJ, and then if, if you have to go to Python, you sort of have to switch your gears. Uh, and that's one of the reasons, like, for the longest time, I used to just use Vim because it's just, even though it makes things harder, it's just familiar. Um, uh, cool. So, yeah, so that's pretty much it for the, 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 the kind of ideas that it was trying to drive. Um, and I'll shall skip most of the paper and go to the, uh, the the results. Not exactly the results, but the the things that you can do to help uh, other people. And that will be the end of my talk for the most part. So I just wanted to see if anyone else wanted to talk and think more about this stuff uh, about these. If not, um, I can jump to. So I'll skip uh, most of the uh, intels of the paper. Um, about how programming is uh, interest uh, about the the various details about the things, and uh, they do talk about limitations of that approach, and then they talk about related work uh, where you know there's actually a lot of body of work on how beginners learn, and there's a lot of body of work on how 
programming language. Uh, there, there's actually very little on programming language transition, but there's a there's there's a lot of pro body on like how knowledge structures are proposed for programmers to encode information. Uh, but I'll skip all of this and go to the design and discussion discussion and design implications. Um, and so the implication first one is that uh, we should design documentation that reduces interference and supports knowledge transfer. So one of the things is that um, so like cheat sheets is one of those things where you know you map up a previous language to a new language. Um, oftentimes I will look at uh, I have like a list of you know things that like how do you do loop and things like that, and I have like a list of like Stack Overflow queries initially where I'll just be like. Here's my list of things that I need to do. Um, and I generally throw it on a document somewhere so that I can refer to it later on. Um, another one is build automated tools that provide on-demand feedback. Um, a lot, so like Python did this really well when, when they switched from Python 3 to Python 2. Uh, from Python 2 to 3, like if you did Python 2 constructs, they actually said what this is. So when I switched from Python 2 to 3, it actually helped me quite a bit where when I saw this error, versus just like syntax error, missing parentheses, or like the compile time byte offset, uh, which is very useless to see as an error message. Um, the third implication is be intentional about programming language syntax and semantics and pragmatics. Um, so one of the uh, things is like you sort of have uh, most, like most programming languages are sort of like, have a have a have a, have an expectation of how the programming language arrives. Like Kotlin will pretty much certainly come from like like Kotlin. A lot of times people come from Java um, because it, it it first came in Android Studio. So maybe like they are looking at Android code. Um, Rust users came from like programming language like C plus plus, and most TypeScript users mostly come directly from JavaScript. A similar thing with Coffee CoffeeScript. Um, one of the things they talk about is that Rust has a very huge learning curve. I myself don't know Rust, but I can imagine. Um, and then they talk about how TypeScript, uh, they, they didn't, uh, they didn't, uh, they, they, the purpose of TypeScript was to give a statically typed experience, but they didn't want it to be too hard for a JavaScript programmer. So they did have a trade-off in the design on that, on that but uh, TypeScript is, is gaining in a lot of popularity. I think it was a very popular language in the new state of JS survey. So, um, and then finally, uh, support not only programming languages, but programming language ecosystems. So React developers provide a tool to create React app. Uh, this is pretty useful to get one of those things up. Um, a lot of times I've seen like, you know, basic setup uh, programming languages where they'll, where here's like a Git, Git, Git repo, which basically contains a fully set up, fully functioning web app. And then you can use, you can start from that and go into other places. Um, and that sort of like minimizes interference to set up things and you can sort of try things out and, and learn as you go versus because the cost of setting up stuff is pretty high. And uh, the other thing is like, like, you know, you, like IntelliJ is pretty, pretty, uh, pretty, the, the, the IntelliJ community starts there. There's a lot of now uh, cool support for a lot of different things. Recently we were programming in TypeScript and I didn't know TypeScript, but the, but the, but the, IDE just makes it so much easier to program over there, and it sort of like does takes care of a lot of heavy lifting. That um, it it didn't feel as hard as if I was like had to learn a lot of the syntax myself. And that is pretty much it for what I had for the mini. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. That's awesome. I love it. Uh, I think I'm going to stop this recording uh, and start a new recording. Uh, for the next talk, but thank you so much, uh, Krishna. That was great. Uh, uh, really appreciate you doing the talk. Yeah, thank you so much. All right, for having me. Yeah.